Uh, so yeah, my name is Kashif and um, I'm on Twitter and on GitHub as well. Um, and what I want to talk to you about today is uh, approximate algorithms uh, in, the con in the context of uh, streaming, where in this uh, st streaming workflow, the data one deals with uh, no longer fits in memory of a single node or uh, arrives inc incrementally over time. It's usually noisy uh, or uncertain. And typically, uh, it's all of these cases. And because of its size, many times we don't really want exact queries over all of our data that we are dealing with. And what I want to present to you are kind of the building blocks of these algorithms, these newer algorithms that give approximate answers, but do so um, uh, are, are, and the answer you get is you get it much quicker and uh, most importantly the space these algorithms take is uh, very very little. Okay. Um, so probabilistic arguments are a key tool for the analysis of these uh, algorithms where one imposes a restriction on the amount of storage space uh, an algorithm is allowed to use for its computation. And we'll be mostly working with discrete random variables. So if you remember the expectation, the expectation of a random variable is just uh, um, is the average of all the possible values uh, this random variable can take, right? And, and you calculate it by its probability times the actual value that random variable can take. Uh, the variance you can is the spread of the var uh, of this uh, random variable, and it's you use the expectation to get the variance. It's given by this formula. Uh, and while a whole host of uh, probabilistic arguments are used, one theorem or a set of theorems in particular are ubiquitous um, in the analysis that, uh, of these uh, approximate algorithms, which is uh, the last one here. But uh, let me just quickly talk about the Chernoff theorem, which says the probability of some random variable um, deviating away from its expected value uh, by some lambda is bounded by its variance divided by lambda square for, for some lambda, for any lambda bigger than zero, for lambda has to be positive. And the Chernoff bound um, uh, gives us even stronger bound on the probability of, of uh, deviation of a random variable, where this random variable now is a, a sum of uh, Bernoulli um, um, uh, uh, some of Bernoulli random variables, which, which are uh, variables that can have either uh, one or zero, like a coin. Okay? Uh, and we'll come to these in a second. Uh, I just wanted to give you some intuition uh, about these uh, things. Uh, so the main motivating question when you want to start with these uh, approximate algorithms is how do you maintain, uh, say, an approximate count for the number of elements, uh, say n, you see in a data stream, um, which can be stored in fewer than log n bits, uh, because if you just count all the bits that, you, uh, that all the all the data that uh, you're uh, getting, uh, that would take uh, log n bits, just by incrementing. And the thing to note here is that uh, this n is uh, typically uh, in in these applications huge. It's a huge number can be uh, like uh, an application would be the, uh, a router sitting there counting the packets that flow through it or counting all the words in Wikipedia, for example. So think of this n as something really huge. And uh, then log n uh, is typically in, uh, uh, for, uh, for applications of these algorithms, uh, log n is just too much. So let me present to you uh, a simple algorithm um, where you maintain a counter x um, using log log n bits. So, and that's much, much smaller than just log n. And the way you do that is you uh, start by, uh, say, make, start the counter uh, to be zero. And whenever you see something, you increment it 
but you now you increment it with a probability of one over two to the uh, value of the counter. So the first time you see something, uh, you increment it because uh, that probability will be one. The next time you increment it or you don't increment it uh, with equal probability and that probability keeps it going down. And any time then when you want to know the answer, uh, you want to know the count, uh, you just output two to the power x minus one. Okay? And to prove that this indeed gives us the count, we have to show a couple of things. We have to show that uh, this, uh, this output here is indeed an uh, unbiased uh, estimator of what we want, the count n. So we want to show that um, in terms of expectation, uh, what we would, uh, the, the, this output would indeed be the value n that, we're, that we want. Okay? And so that's exactly my first claim here that um, after seeing n bits, the if the state of my counter uh, is xn, then the expected value of 2 to the xn is just n plus 1. And that's why uh, 2 to the xn minus 1 would be n, which is, if I go back, which is what my output is. All right? And if this is true, if uh, claim 1, if you believe claim 1, then uh, taking logs on both sides gives me uh, the expected value of xn is just log of n plus 1, which then implies that the expected number of bits in this counter is indeed uh, log log n plus uh, uh, some constant. Okay? So very small. It takes up uh, very little space, and uh, um, uh, I just uh, and it's an unbiased estimator. And to prove that is not so complicated. Uh, <laughs> the, the the expectation you just put it in the formula. It's just a probability uh, that x n is some number times uh, its value, right? Uh, and summing it up. And uh, the thing is, uh, what this says is that the our counter is uh, some value j. Well, our counter is some value j. The only way that can happen is, is, is that if uh, at uh, n minus 1 it was j and we did not, we did, didn't, did not increment, or at x n minus 1 it was j minus 1 and we did increment. And we know the probabilities of incrementing and not, in, not incrementing. It's uh, 1 on 2 to the j or 1 minus 1 on 2 to the j. So you put that all in and things cancel out, and you end up with uh, uh, on w w one expression, which is just the expectation of now 2 to the xn minus 1, plus uh, uh, this probability, which is just 1. And so it's like a recurrence relation. You keep doing that. Uh, you can only do that n times. So you end up with the... Um, so you do the same argument again with the with 2 to the xn n minus 1 now, and at the end you end up with, indeed, uh, the fact that this, uh, this estimator will give you, uh, in, term, in expectations, the correct thing, the count. Okay? Uh, getting expectations is one thing. We also want to know now the variance of, the, uh, of this estimator, how, how good it is. And it turns out that's also easy to do. Uh, the, um, that's my second claim, that the variance is uh, n squared. You can think of the variance being like something like n squared. So that's the, the spread of this, uh, of this uh, uh, estimator. And to do that, you just need to uh, calculate the expectation of, uh, well, you need to use this formula, and so you need, we already know this. It's just uh, from, it's just uh, n plus 1 squared. Uh, and so we need the expectation of uh, our estimator square, which is that, and you, you, it's the same argument, and you get this formula, you plug it in, and you get uh, the variance now is, uh, is so much. So then, oops, then the question is, uh, w we would like to have a better understanding of uh, this estimator. For, for instance, given some epsilon, some small epsilon, which is positive, what is the probability that our estimator is epsilon n away from, uh, from its expectation, right? Uh, so this is our estimator, and this is its expectation. So what is the probability that, uh, which, we, which we call the probability of uh, this algorithm failing us, if it's, if it's too big? And 
Again, this uh, is, looks like uh, we can use Chevy Chef, the, one of the, the tail bounds I showed you. And if you do that, um, you get the probability of, uh, of our estimator uh, being um, epsilon n away from its, uh, what it should estimate uh, is like 1 on epsilon squared. All right? And so epsilon, is, you can think of a small number. And so this, uh, uh, when 1 on epsilon squared is uh, something big, so this is really not a good uh, estimator, all right? Um, uh, typically, what we would like is uh, to have an algorithm that gives us arbitrarily uh, a, a, prob a, a probability of failure as small as we want. Uh, and this is not doing it. So what you can do is you can, uh, which is another uh, standard statistical uh, uh, argument, what you do is you lower your variance by now running t different uh, uh, independent counters um, in parallel. And uh, then when you want to know, uh, when you want to query your uh, count, all you do is you take the average of these t counters that you have, and uh, turns out the expectation of the average is still the n plus 1. So it's still an unbiased estimator, but what has happened now is that our variance has gone down by 1 on t. Because uh, these t counters I'm running in parallel and they're independent of each other. All right? And because of that, uh, my third claim then is that uh, I can uh, use now, um, um, I can use, uh, uh, use the fact that the variance of, the, of my averages is 1 on t. Uh, to say that the probability of failure, I can, uh, if I run, uh, if I have, say, uh, t bigger than some constant divided by epsilon squared uh, counters, parallel counters, and I, I, um, I um, compute their average, uh, then uh, that average deviates from the actual uh, count that we want uh, by a fixed uh, by any fixed uh, probability, right? And that fixed probability actually depends on this constant c. So we can say run 60 or so, uh, for example, parallel counters and average them up, and I'll get that my, uh, my the expected answer that I have is, will be very close to the actual one uh, by any fixed probability, all right? Which is really great. So. Just by running, and, and the space required for running, uh, say, t parallel counters is just t times log log n, which is not much at all. All right? And in fact, we can do something even better. We can now run uh, m, we can run m, uh, which uh, is uh, of size log 1 on delta. Uh, uh, we run uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, average, uh, this average trick m times. And we do the average t times and run the, this thing m times. And then so we have uh, now m different uh, averages. And at the end, I, comp I output the median of my uh, m averages. And turns out, if you do that, you can reduce the probability of your algorithm failing by, uh, by delta. And you can make delta as small as you want. All right? uh, and um, the smaller you make delta, the more m's you will need and the smaller you make uh, epsilon, the more t's you will need. But now you have control of having as much, um, as much uh, uh, precision as you like. All you need to do is run m times t different counters. All right. And so uh, with these uh, kind of arguments and these tricks, you can uh, actually do quite a lot. Um, what I just showed you uh, was uh, calculating the number of elements in a stream. And again, it took like order log log m space. But you can also do, uh, for example, find uh, distinct elements in a stream. Uh, and here's a, uh, here's, a, a, here's a data structure. Here's that uh, tiny array where uh, all, the w all the words, say, in, in the complete works of Shakespeare kind of fit into this. And it gives me uh, an answer for all the uh, words, all the distinct words in Shakespeare uh, with a relative error of 9%. Uh, 
Uh, you can do a second momentum uh, of a stream that takes uh, order log n. And you can apply the same algorithms for graphs to ca calculate approximate connectivity, approximate connected components, and many, many other uh, very important algorithms, but most importantly in very tiny space. OK? So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you.